Hi Reality NXT viewers, I'm Kritika Singh Rawat, your host and on today's brand new episode of Let's Talk Business, we have a special guest with us, Anirudh Khandelwal, the Managing Director of Khandelwal Group. The exchange of insights in today's discussion adds depth to our exploration, providing you with a comprehensive understanding of Khandelwal Group vision and direction in the ever-evolving industry. Thank you, Anirudh, for joining us today on Let's Talk Business by Reality NXT. Thank you for having me, Kritika. So, Anirudh, I want to know the inception story of Khandelwal Group. How did it all start? And uh, what made you enter the real estate industry? So, Khandelwal Group is a 40-year-old institution in itself. It was started by my grandpa and then sort of, you know, very closely followed by my dad. Uh, so my grandfather was actually into leasing and subleasing, and then my dad is uh, my dad and uh, my brother-in-law they came in as uh, contractors for uh, Gypsum at that time. There was a brand called Newwood, mm. and we were contractors. And then from there they picked up the line, and you know they to a level where they fell in love with it so much that they dove headfirst directly into real estate itself. And they were one of the best contractors for gypsum boards um, for that particular brand at that time. But you know, when they got into it, they started understanding. They just dove head first into it, closely followed by my chachas coming in. Um, and by the time that my youngest chacha came into the field, we knew that this is all that we want to do for the rest of uh, you know, as in they knew that this is yeah. what they wanted to do for the rest of their life. Mm. Um, and so we, we sort of grew up with uh, seeing them do their thing and you know as in family businesses you the uh, there is there is no boundary as such between professionalism and personal life you know it, it bleeds into one another so you you see your father figures you see your chachas all talking about this stuff you know it, it, it starts becoming fascinating you start developing a sense of form about this thing and we could be so by the time that I uh, entered my 12th, I knew that I, I wanted to do something related to the line. Mm. Because this is what I wanted to come into. I was always decent at drawing. So somewhere I was, uh, you know, I thought that I can go into architecture. So I did my architecture and then I joined in as the third generation. Okay. And uh, my cousins who are not that good at drawing decided to go into civil engineering. So all of them have done their civil engineering mm. and then lastly my youngest cousin who we just spoke about before the interview, he is, uh, he went into economics and you know he's mm. coming from that sort of field. So somewhere we have you know nurtured the talent all within the family itself and we are taking it ahead and that perspective as it comes in also adds into the journey. Mm. So but I'm sure uh, during your father project visit, mm -hmm. did you accompany him in those uh, field trips or on those project sites? Yes, yes. So, see, as I said, that there is this fascination and there's this focus. So, during my, uh, right after my boards, in fact, uh, when I was in my 10th grade, right after my boards, I asked them, you know, how can I be useful? Because I don't want to sit at home all the time. I have done everything that I wanted to do now. I have partied. I have gone out, I have gone here, I have gone there, now I want to do something else. So they said, okay, there is a site that is running, and go, like, go and see what happens. Mm -hmm. If you want, you can go and, you know, you can sit over there. And for every flat that you sell, I'll give you some money. Okay. So that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. So me and my cousin, we actually used to go on site. We were on site, I think, for two or three weeks. And, uh, you know, the first two weeks, obviously, you were still understanding what's going on. People also used to look like, who have they employed? Who are these guys? Uh, you know, no beard, broken out, tall, lanky fellow. Uh, but as and how we got into it, by the third week, me and my cousin, we sold four flats. So we were pretty proud of ourselves. Yeah. You know, like, we carried the pitch. We spoke to the clients. We addressed them. Yeah. And yeah, so... Somewhere, I always knew like this is where I want to end up in mm. and 
then there was also that sort of fascination of what can I bring to the table, mm. you know, so you get up with that and that, yeah. fascin that fascination stays with you mm. as you enter into the field. Obviously, as you learn more and more, you figure out your place mm. within the hierarchy and within the group also. So, yeah. so you were clear that you're designing, as you said, you were very good in designing and you wanted to pursue. I was good in drawing. <laughs> so let's say you were good in drawing and yeah. you wanted to pursue in architecture. Did yeah. that also give you a vision that, you know, I want to build something in this brand itself so that you can see it executed in front of your eyes. Like you're giving dream homes to the customers, right? right. And when you build something for someone who has an emotional investment to it, yeah. it does bring some kind of responsibility, also a, a great vision, right? How to go about it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when I came in, to, so I tell you what, when I joined architecture, actually uh, I fell in love with architecture itself. To a point where I told my dad that I don't want to go to the I want to go architecture firm. Then as we went about it, I interned with uh, Mr. Sanjay Puri. In my third year, I interned with uh, Mr. Hafiz contractor. Uh, they brought more perspective into the field. And then, you know, when I used to sit on residential towers, see the typical floor design that's not that interesting or that challenging for an architect. So, mm. and I used to be like, this is very boring, yeah. Like, how can I keep doing this 9 to 5? Of, of course, that was my perspective back then. Mm -hmm. As an architect, you come fresh off the creativity boat and you see things happening, it, the repetition, it gets to you somewhere. Then beyond that, my father was like, okay, I respect your decision. But once, just uh, for my sake, try to uh, also do an internship with Mr. Mukesh Bahadur, mm -hmm. who is an expert in uh, slum architecture, SRA. Yeah. So I went over there and I got extremely fascinated because that is a completely different thing. The creativity that is applied over there is applied with respect to, uh, you know, the DCPR bylaws, the calculations, mm -hmm. what are you bringing to the table, where would you design and how would you design and how could that end up costing a client a lot of money. So yeah. your creative decisions also have a lot of responsibility on them. Mm -hmm. and that responsibility is absolutely needed as well because you don't want people to you know take undue advantage of it mm. so i saw that i fell in love with that as well so then i was extremely confused i'm like now what do i do uh, he said okay so now you have two options you can either continue the way you are going about things mm. or you can zoom out and you know figure out your place somewhere that is where i was also because suddenly i was stuck you know I like okay I want to be creative but then I also want to sort of you know be creative with some substance so to, to give you a perspective the best architect in the world is Zahadi yeah. and uh, I mean argumentatively mm -hmm. but her works for, for the first 20 years of her life she did not actually build anything everything was just on paper mm -hmm. so somewhere that perspective also hits you hard where you're like me you want to do something you want to make something impactful mm. or something contributing at least you can't just stay on paper because that uh, you like I have seen firsthand that that gets very frustrating yeah. so with that in mind I was like okay, you know what I'm just going to do a master's in management mm. and at the same time towards the end of my architectural course when we have the dissertation here mind you I was so creative I did a dissertation not on housing or on uh, you know commercial I did a housing on comic book museum so my perspective went over there mm. then from there i when i interned with mr Vash, uh, with mr mukesh Bahadur, i started coming back into the family business started loving that again mm. started understanding that even if there is a typical floor how much that typical floor makes an impact to the people that it does mm. how you can still add value to something that is continuously being repetitive yes uh, at the end of the day, see, a person still makes his own home unique. True. You know, you, you provide the finishing and then beyond that, you know, it is, it is on their best judgment what yeah. they do with it. But it still has to be a welcoming structure to get into. As you said, home of dreams, right? That's mm -hmm. So somewhere, how do you continuously do that again and again and again? Mm -hmm. So, you know, then, so I did my master's in management, came back 
and went into the business. At that point of time, as soon as I had gotten back, within I think six months of that, there was Demon, there was Rira. Yeah. So till that point of time, I was still figuring out, you know, what can I do over here. But the second demonetization happened and Rira happened, mm -hmm. suddenly experience of your elders, of everyone around did not matter because Rira was something that hit everyone at the same time. Yeah. Everyone got exposed to it simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And because a lot of what Rira had to do with was digital, mm -hmm. uh, and as is the perspective in, you know, families with uh, second generation and first generation, are it, the task of managing Rira for the projects was assigned to me. Mm -hmm. And so I used to go to the you know the CAs, the, the lawyers, the everyone, figure out what is going on, what is everyone else doing. Mm -hmm. Put that into perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of uh, the way things used to happen also changed because of the regulations that came in. And we and I understood that you know this is something to wholeheartedly welcome mm. because what this is doing this is great for developers who stay uh, you know true and ethical. True. So somewhere till that point of time you know we were the, like at least people in my household were quite frustrated. You know, compliances are being to karte whatever. I said no no look at this in the long run mm. because the better you get at this. The better your record over here, the better people will understand. And by that time, you know, obviously we all knew that we are in the information age. Yeah. Also, with regards to the communication, transparency Absolutely. has to be there. Yeah. So that's what yeah. so the information is there for, right? Yeah. So I said, this this information that we are building up, this is going to add more and more value to the group. Yeah. You know, even if it is in compliance right now for us to do one more, two more compliances, it's not like you haven't faced compliances. Yeah. When they used to work, there was flower beds. Mm -hmm. By the time I came into the business, there was fungible. So, you know, it's not like you didn't evolve, but you still stay true into the business. You know, this is just another step to that. And there might be 10 more after this, but these things, they'll matter. Mm -hmm. You know, the, when we have to go to banks, when people have to see you, when people will, Today I can, you know, today the, the, I can see my phone and I can check the history geography of a brand or a person. So these things, they will matter, they will create an impact. Might as well use it to create a positive and a better impact. So sure. that was where I found my place mm -hmm. uh, within the company. Then from there on, joined Naretco, became an active part over there. That also helped because uh, the biggest challenge of getting into a family business is that people just expect you to do things. Nothing is delegated to you, you know. And as far as your staff is concerned, they are saying that boss, tum sida gaddi hai. So you have to impress your higher ups and your lower ups. Mm. And you have to prove yourself somewhere over there. Mm. And I had no clue what to do over there because if I would talk about architecture like from Zaha this architecture and into you know my plans and everything my architect should go like kar sakte ho, but isme aapka sale hi jayega. per square yeah. foot aapko itta fatka to padega hi padega so yeah. you know like shit can't make a fool of myself over here mm. then you are like Achha, can i do this Nahi, isme aise kaise hoega, aise kaise hoega. Mm. and rera happened i was extremely happy because now i know something that i can add into when Naretko, when I actually came across Naretko and I joined it, and I and I and I keep preaching this to every fellow developer that join a network. Mm -hmm. Because the problem with family businesses is that a lot of the knowledge just continuously keeps on getting internalized mm -hmm. and recycled and recycled and recycled to a point of redundancy. Yeah. You know, and your uh, experience is only as good as your exposure. The more you are exposed to the outside world, the more you're pushing your frontier, the better it gets for you. So that is how I started adding value into the group. As you mentioned that there are a lot of second generation and third generation has come in in this particular real estate, especially in Mumbai we have seen, yeah. right? So there are a lot of other players. How do you uh, differentiate when it comes to your brand in terms of values or vision? How would you say that the Nailwal group stands apart from the rest other players who are active? So one of the ways that we kind of differentiate is we 
even before era we used to take accountability absolutely seriously mm-hmm. you know and now more so uh, i i remember when the uh, when when my project was launched uh, in gorebadi about 2 years back uh, i was i was there at 8 o'clock in the morning at my sales office the day of the launch mm-hmm. and this was during lockdown uh, and our marketing team did a fabulous job uh, during a heavy heavy rainy day 1200 people showed up over there i personally treated i think 90% of them mm-hmm. second day ended up with covid myself mm-hmm. so somewhere that accountability is really really ingrained into us so when you say accountability accountability in the sense that you know be uh, be responsible be out there okay you know for everything and that you can sort of take home and put into your projects and integrate it don't just uh, uh, you know rely on consultants mm. don't just rely on uh, rely on advisories or you know stuff like this the data that you are getting yes understand it on one hand but then balance it with your personal experience also true and then let that merge into it and you know stay true to the integrity of your project mm. and let it come out and that itself talks for your project also so uh tomorrow when you know as is the case with i think every other developer when issues are faced yeah there will never be a director or there will never be an employee who will be answerable to the society they will say okay my son will handle this thing you can talk to him mm-hmm. my nephew will handle this thing you can talk to him my cousin will handle this thing you you can talk to him that somewhere brings assurance to the minds of the customers that you know today i can directly talk to the business owner Yeah. About my issue, he's directly answerable to me. Mm-hmm. That that tra- transforms into goodwill actually for us. There have been projects where we have faced issues mm-hmm. when there was a delay, when there was an issue. We have always been there for them. It didn't matter. People were left happy right after that. They spoke highly of us. That is how we kept on getting more projects. So somewhere you have to know that it is not just about the customer. It is also you know you are you are in the business of redevelopment. Your second largest stakeholders are the society themselves. Yeah. So the accountability that you maintain over there that matters a lot. True. So whenever there are tender forms or anything at all, like I will never have my guy fill it and then I will read it and check it. You know, I'll be the one to fill it to understand it, talk directly to the society in charge. So unless there is some absolutely random work which requires a person of contact, usually the person of uh, person of contact mm-hmm. would. Mostly be a candidate only from our office. So, are there any particular projects or initiatives taken by the brand which uh, talks about excellence? If you had to name some. As of right now, we have a current project that is going on mm-hmm. in Borivali, in in, in Chako. And uh, when we started that project, before that we had phase one where I used to be a uh, where I went as a fifteen year old. Yeah. And, you know, that was 16 17 years ago that project right next to it is our phase 2 which got launched very recently when you know crz and all these other issues they cleared up we mm-hmm. decided that now the project is right for launch so we decided to go ahead with it of course we had other issues over there as well as a reservation and whatever whatever cleared all of that out went in over there uh what really uh so we did we did the entire Works, you know, the marketing, the holdings, the whatever is required today to sort of make your brand relevant to have the project visible. Mm-hmm. Because when my uh, dad and chachas were working, it was still a seller's market. Mm-hmm. You know, now it's become a buyer's market. Yeah. You have to cater to the buyer. You have to work as per their wishes. You have to make it palatable to them. Mm-hmm. So we did the whole shebang that was expected of us. what mattered at the end of the day when the customers came in was the fact that my project phase 1 which is 17 years old people from there came mm. by themselves nobody called them nobody expected them also to just like show up they came they booked houses in my new project because they wanted to you know move up or take a step up mm. they also raved to the people that we have been living in their project and now we are here so that sort of value mm. you know it 
I mean, it's not like a great project per se. You know? it's, it, it doesn't like stand out. It's not that iconic. Mm. But the fact is that the quality that we deliver mm. spoke for itself. And that marketing, that I won't even call it marketing, that was just goodwill. Mm. But that goodwill gave me, uh, gave my buyers the confidence to invest with us, to, to come into our project. So within a month, mm. I had uh, all my two PhDs in the latest project sold out. The other thing that we did uh, that we did was we ensured like uh, last mile closure. Mm. What I what I mean by that is you know when you do the entire uh, when you do the sales office and the sample flat, mm. we ensure that the sample flat will look exactly how a person would want it to look. Like it, it's not something that's just template architecture. Mm. You get the best brands in it. You get the best uh, um, you know show pieces in it. And I know this sounds a little cliche, but we actually did go the last night to a point where we ourselves looked at the furniture that is coming in, looked at the uh, accessories that are going to be placed over there, looked mm -hmm. at the TVs, looked at the uh, you know kitchenette, cabinet, whatever, mm -hmm. and it helped because that personal touch matters. You, you might think that you know this is just not going to be noticed, or you're just doing this because you're an OCD, but no, mm -hmm. it the buyer actually appreciates it. You don't have to go to the buyer and tell them, yes, I'm yeah, yeah. You know, that was never something that was spoken. That was not even something that we expected to advertise. But the fact of the matter is that when uh, ladies walked into the kitchen, mm. they really appreciated the kitchen. To a point where, you know, my uh, dad and chacha, they, they also showed it to the women of the house. That, this, yeah. this is how it will be. Is this good? Is this not? Mm. When they took around, they suggested some changes incorporated that it matters it spoke mm. to the people so when you give when you put that personal touch somewhere it goes uh, you know a long way the mm. same thing with the project that is right next to it see which phase one it's called mm. it doesn't stand out there is nothing that uh, you know uh, iconic about it mm. but just when you put in the little details because this because every project for you you know, for, for a developer can just be a project, but for mm. some, for your end customer, it's a lifetime purchase. Yeah. You know, the more you put into a project, whatever, even with your limited capability, mm. but the more you put into it, the more dedication you give it, it, it speaks at the end of the day. You keep highlighting the word iconic. It's not iconic, but we are doing this. Uh, in terms of customer centric excellence, right, mm. you are touching the right nose by saying accountability is there, you're providing the quality projects. I want to know what else you're doing differently because every developer now is saying Ki we are providing different kind of amenities based on what kind of customers are coming. Even though as you kept highlighting, it could iconic nahi hai, but I'm sure you are doing something different which is catering to the right customers and who are willing to buy, right? Because it is not just by the sample flat, I'm sure it's also the kind of other uh, details which are considered. So each project, if you could just let us go through the one which is already existing and what one which is upcoming. Yeah. How do you uh, finalize when it comes to amenities? How do you finalize by keeping a home buyer in mind? So yeah, as we said, of course the home buyer sentiment it matters mm -hmm. to a point where now you know when we are in the information age all this information is also readily available with you know uh, applications like CRE matrix and yeah. radar yeah. data and yeah. all of this stuff uh, of course it also becomes very important to not get lost in the data True. so somewhere we also rely on a gut check in the sense that pichli project mein aisa kiya tha mm. so then it would be practical to not completely pivot to what the data is telling you but to somewhere be in the middle path of what you did vis-a-vis mm. -vis what the data is also telling you case in point balconies yeah. so with balconies earlier with uh, you know once once the rules evolved from free flower bed to fungible it was something that was deterrent all across the board uh, buyers used to go like balcony kaun khari dega yeah. khali space ka kaun kharcha karega Builders used to go like, Khali space ka ko charge karna padega. I don't think the buyer will understand. Mm -hmm. And rightly so. Mm -hmm. The purchasing power, the you know, the per square foot rate 
in our city, reserve rate of per square foot rate everywhere else, it makes a difference into what you can give in a home. Uh, but after lockdown, that perspective changed immensely. People realized the importance of having an accessible uh, connection to open space, to the atmosphere, to the you know, you know to the outdoors. Yeah. And balconies again came into play. Mm. I mean, they uh, so around I think twenty to twenty five square feet is the sweet spot. Mm. Uh, is at least what we have seen. You, know, you give that much of a balcony, at least it matters greatly. Uh, the more a person envisions it, it matters that much more. Yeah. You know, so how there is a uh, there was this idea that you have to design your kitchen right, you have to design your living room without passages. Now even the way you can shape your balcony, the way you can give it its accessibility, the kind of function that a person can do from it, that matters too. Mm. So you know that is something that we have seen has made a huge difference. Mm. The other thing that we have also seen as per home buyer sentiment and data also funnily enough is the uh, size of the kitchen and how much it has uh, differed from you know the kind of demographic evolution. Yeah. When I mean my generation the husband and the wife both are working. Mm -hmm. Kitchen is not necessarily a space for sustenance. It has also now become a space for uh, you know hobby activities and stuff. So somewhere the size of that has to be as per that. Vis a vis the evolution of cloud kitchens. So I know most of my friends, 90% of the time, they'll be like, Chal, kuch order kar lete you are too tired, I'm too tired. Mm. You've had a long day in office. You know, might as well just order something. But at the same time, the husband one day might go like, you know, I want to make a pasta today. Mm. I want to do this today. Or the wife is going on to do a try stir fry that I saw on YouTube. So, those differences have also evolved and then the more you can evolve this into your flat, right, keeping also true to practicality of it. I mean, you don't just like shrink it to an alcove and give a platform yeah. and go like, yeah, you don't need it. Yeah. That is not what works. But then at the same time, understanding the sentiment and going like, okay, you know what, maybe we can give you a lesser kitchen, but a bigger living room, make space for a balcony so that your ticket size you know, stays true at its level, but then you have more to sh uh, for, uh, for yourself within the same flat simply because somewhere you have your own trade offs and you know you can uh, you can balance these things out. And I know they will make a difference to you. Yeah. That speaks to the customer, so that so, is something that we have integrated. Within so, our if projects. you had to give example from your existing and upcoming projects, right. Uh, so when it comes to amenities, right, we have seen especially in all the markets, especially in Mumbai, uh, the developers are promising a lot of amenities, which yeah. is sometimes unnecessary, even the home buyers is not looking for such, certain amenities. Yeah. First of all, do you think that's true? And secondly, uh, give us your vision when it comes to your projects, how you guys decide amenities? So, as I said, uh, the way we see amenities is as per scale. You have to keep amenities, especially those amenities which bring true value to the project. If you are having 600 flats in a project, if you are having 200 flats in a project, any, any project which has more than 100 flats in it, mm. you have to understand that a sense of community will be created within that project. Yeah. So all my upcoming projects right now, they are all uh, having a minimum of 100 flats. My Borivadi project has 600 flats in it. My Andheri flat, uh, my Andheri project has 100 flats. Oshivara has 656 flats in it. Mm. These these suddenly become high density urban uh, structures yeah. within themselves. No matter the size of the project, it is still high density. Mm. Mumbai itself being a high density city. Mm. Case in point, if you completely zoom out from it and look at it, you have 50% of the population of Canada which is five times the size of India yeah. living in a tiny minuscule pocket sized space. Mm. You know, this is a megapolis in itself. Now you want to overload amenities over there, uh, put, uh, you know, rack up your maintenance bills and all that and know that most of them are not going to be used ever. People are going to completely forget about them. That's on you. How we see it is that, okay, when there are 600 people, 
you know, and we have the space to provide a swimming pool, let's provide a swimming pool. Is health club completely necessary? Maybe, you know, a part of it can be a health club, maybe a part of it can be a studio which can also function as a multi-purpose hall, let's do that. Yeah. Because uh, for a lot of people, a very big flex when it comes to weddings, which is where we spend bonkers on, mm. I think, uh, you know, as Indians, is that my building ke andari, our family ka ruka hua, mere building ke andari hum log reception kar rahe. Mm. These things they matter. Yeah. They matter to a point where people go like, this guy provided fantabulous amenities, mm -hmm. you know, because at the end of the day, uh, rather than the location, you would spend more on the decor and making it more centric and stuff like that. I want to uh, know when his next project is coming up, I would be interested in, mm -hmm. you know, looking over there. So there are these very, very subtexts that you have to sort of see and you have to keep things practical. Mm. You know, putting a spa in your project, how much of a difference does that make? Yeah. Uh, you have the demographic for it also. Yeah. You know, the demographic that likes a spa, are they even going to come into your spa? Mm. Do they have a regular uh, a repeat customer loyalty program mm. in the spas that are around? Maybe they could do with a different space than a spa. So, you know, those things you look at and you put it over there mm. and they matter. The other thing that really matters also is the ability to pivot. Yeah. Let's say that I have provided an amenity. Mm. Most of my customers that are coming in, they are saying that he itta samaj mein nahi aaya, aap isko aisa kyun nahi mana dete ho? Listen to them. Mm. You know, keep your ear on the ground, we tend to do that and then we tend to, you know, retrofit it. Mm. Necessarily, an amenity is being a waste of space. They might want more parking. Listen to the customer, mm. because these things they matter. So we, do, you know, if if rather than a ramp, you have to give a car lift uh, because you have a uh, spa over there, then that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. stick true to the functions that are really going to matter. Mm. Then beyond that, whatever space is left over there, are the amenities that you need to add. Rather than just giving a list, plethora of amenities, talk about the essentials that are there in your project, which is what we do. You know, today a buyer can come in, there are, uh, let's say, 400 parkings over there, to go up a ramp and then to look for your parking and everything. I know, I wouldn't want to waste my time doing that, my next 15 minutes. I know for a fact that this uh, community does not have the capacity to indulge in a valet system. So then might as well give a puzzle. Now you space, now you've saved space. Okay, so what can you give in that space? That doesn't necessarily mean that a guy who cannot, uh, you know, who necessarily cannot appreciate a valet wants a spa over there. So then give a multifunctional room. As far as the gym is concerned, look at this. So we, so we saw these things evolve from our project. As I said, phase one, uh, we had done a project next to it. We gave a very small pocket size swimming pool over there. We gave a gym room over there. We saw the amenities that are being used over there that helped us decide the size of the swimming pool, the size of the health club and then whatever balance space we had, what to do with that. Mm. Should we make it a society office which functions as a multifunctional room? Should we make it a volleyball court, a squash court? What about the uh, podiums? Should mm. you want to make it a natural lawn? You want to make it a turf because the turf becomes easier. These things, the details also today the customer uh, is smart enough to understand, yeah. you know, long term, how are these things going to rack up and how they matter. So we saw that happen and then we, um, as I said, I have large projects and I have small projects as well. So we decided to cr cross platform and see how we can evolve it on a smaller scale project as well. Mm. So if you have a smaller size terrace, you don't necessarily want to turf the entire thing up, you know, give a deck, give a lounge. Make a little bit of it at turf today. People can play cricket in this much space, you know, mm. between you and me. Mm. So appreciate that, let that happen. If there's a dead wall that is there from the LMR, see if that can be sort of a space for a projector. Mm. You don't have to provide the projector, mm. but then you know, ensure that the space is there because yeah. the communal activities can be fostered in this much also, and this will create a goodwill for your brand. Today, if my one of my walls is smooth enough for a projector. Ten other buildings are going to come over there, uh, you know, especially in places like Pali East where there are smaller projects yeah. but the communal sense is a lot more, mm. you know, the, the social factor is a lot more. 
people invite each other to each other's houses world cup ke the dekha hai chal mere terrace se dekhte hain yeah you know i i don't have to put a radio ad over there ki mere terrace se ye dekho it is happening mm-hmm. for me sure. you know those are practical amenities that can be put over there mm-hmm. yes when you have the layout for it when you have the demographic for it put it mm-hmm. you know but without it just for the heck of it you want to give a herb garden to somebody mm-hmm. i mean it you know it, it makes no sense you might as well you know do something around it yeah so so in the coming years yeah as a group where or which location uh, the brand is interested in and what kind of concepts you guys want to experiment in the coming years what on milestones <laughs> are we looking at so i uh, we have a project that is coming up in lower paria mm. Uh, we have a project that is coming up in Oshiwara because these projects are at um, you know plan passing stage mm. there is not much room for experimentation as such mm. beyond that also uh, you know see that there, there is there is something to interpret from the data and there is something to interpret from the lack of it also mm-hmm. you know so so we try to stay uh somewhere in the middle of it because you don't want to get lost in it and take a decision that won't make sense i know that during a lockdown there was a huge uh, buzz about uh, co-living yeah co-living as a sensibility for the quintessential indian customer how, how much uh, you know how practical is it mm-hmm. i'm still unsure to a level where even in uh, even towards the uh, asian perspective of this you know i mean you have mega policies like tokyo mm. hong kong mm. you know uh, extremely high value uh, real estate mm. you have 100 square foot flats also mm. they are not being rented people are living there they have bought it mm. you know uh, yes it does matter that you know there will be a floating crowd yes they will come in yes there are these experiments that are happening but then look at the cost that you are incurring mm. you know which are be the final product that you are given look at how much can you pivot within the project itself also like once you have incurred all your costs and everything mm. uh, tomorrow if the idea tanks what can you do with the structure that you have made over there so right. keeping these things in mind what is the final product that i can make i rather stay true and focus to the formula that is being made mm-hmm. i mean i have this thing where uh, you know we say this uh, prepare for the worst hope for the best mm-hmm. especially in real estate mm-hmm. you know and with the way things are going about i mean you know that there are the, the pollution spikes up yeah the premiums increase the laws change the there is some ambiguity related to some transition policy some you know within that what is the safest possible product that you can always make that will be most resilient yeah. okay now on top of that what, what is the risk factor that you can build up on yeah. you know a student housing something that you can look at yeah. is uh, co living something you can look at is co working something you can look at yeah. what are the returns that they will give you and whether they are worth the risk that you are taking for them yeah. then you figure out sort of a hybrid model over there you so know, but f- future are you looking into these uh, particular so it, within my existing projects absolutely not huh. uh but let's say that uh, you know the, uh, if there is something that i come across within lower period you know that is very close to all the office spaces and everything mm. uh, knowing that we have a decent population of expats as well mm. uh who would be in the younger more flexible demographic mm-hmm. then yes why not but as such within the ones that are see within redevelopment itself also you have to understand your stakeholders yeah if i'm taking a building from someone and i'm saying that you know what you guys are all old but the but i'm going to make this a student housing mm-hmm. and the people are going to come and go as they please they're going to party till 10 o'clock 11 o'clock you know jo karne ka karo aisa hi hoga nahi to nahi hoga this is not Of you know this is not something that's practical mm. 
so and so it is important to know that yes this is your next milestone but then is are we where are you putting it where are you anchoring it mm. so these things have to sort of uh, you know be uh, looked at if there's a green field project that is coming up then yes why not yeah maybe you know as a whole if the entire thing can be turned into a polling space yeah, i would love to do that you know simply because we see the impact that that thing uh, that that is having at least in other parts of the globe and we feel like now is the right time to bring it in and you know experiment with it mm. but if i have to do a redevelopment and then in that redevelopment i have to pivot mm. to the experimentations and i wouldn't consider that practical or be able to you know or be doing that as well so in the coming years which are the areas that interest the brand to invest or to redevelop as such you know uh, because we have stayed uh, you know we, we have kept things very small and mm. you know then even keen and one of the reasons for that is also because we are self funded yeah somewhere my grandpa uh, drew a line where he was like don't fall into this easy money trap mm. because it gives you a sense of hubris and you do not want to get into that you know then obviously like when we came in we challenged that and we said that you know not everyone i mean hubris was at that point of time mm-hmm. the then mm-hmm. now with accountability and transparency and everything increasing you also know fair to draw the line mm-hmm. to a level where even your consultants know that you know maybe we should ease it a little bit so yeah. with that in mind somewhere there has to be some mm-hmm. balance mm-hmm. to the entire thing but as things were going about with us being self funded there was only a limited scope of things that we could do mm-hmm. with the capital that we had so uh, we kept it small we kept it hyper local where our goodwill spread within the 0.5 mile radius we took projects over there only and where our goodwill is also right now we continue to capitalize on it so mm-hmm. i have my goodwill in four bangalores mm-hmm. so i will continue to capitalize it uh, uh, capitalize on it in the future you know because i'm a household name within that region yeah. khandelwal ka hai khandelwal de se le raha hai uh, project kar raha hai de 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 aap bant kar ke de I'm not saying this. I've heard it, so I'm mm-hmm. saying it. Uh, so somewhere where that kind of confidence you've inspired, uh, stick to it. You know that that is what we do. Mm-hmm. Parley East, Villa Parley, uh, Four Bangalows mm-hmm. is what is the areas that we are going to uh, you know cont- uh, be looking at developing uh, future mm-hmm. projects as well. Beyond this. because i have my larger project spread across mumbai whatever buzz they generate for me whatever goodwill they create for me if that brings me around to a bigger opportunity a better opportunity then that is what we will take and we will develop on that but uh the fact of the matter is that when we have stayed the way we have which is mm-hmm. little low key you know controlled uh, progress slow and steady gradient that uh doesn't keep us extremely adventurous to just continuously you know keep on uh, picking up projects or just to go like you know all open wala sounds fantastic i want to go there yeah we like to sort of evolve the next big thing within our own area itself so let's say that you know maybe i've been doing like one project at a time or like one one side i would like to have like five of them amalgamated and make a beautiful building over there you know? something that people can talk about mm. uh the project that i have in lower barrel that is on elfinstone road mm. uh it is right next to the uh, mthl expressway mm. it is an extremely challenging project but i know that this is something that is going to grab eyeballs yeah so with that in mind you know you want to make something so beautiful over there that people actually pause and look at it and just you know keep keep in mind that there is something that comes over there. so you wanted to be a point where they were like are jab tu wo sundar building se pass karega tab tere ko jana chahiye so these are things that mm. we want to look at necessarily you know uh co living student housing they all have their place in you know the evolution of real estate but then until it really comes into the mainstream which is very difficult because the returns however you calculate it with whatever uh, 
you know equation you want to put it it never comes up to more than 6% and if i have to do if i have to look at 6% then i'd rather put it in fd and then go around the world okay. so somewhere until that thing catches up and people become that much more flexible and housing is something that takes a back seat it makes no sense yeah for me to experiment as such right now housing is the thing that is to stay people understand after lockdown the importance of housing people are those who are taking 1 bhk have understood that maybe look at 1 and a half bhk mm. those who are on rent have considered that you know mera jitna rent bharta hu utna mein mera emi hoga to main kahan pe jaake ek permanent uh, anchor rakh sakta hu mm. so these perspectives they are evolving the housing market itself you know so we look at it from that perspective I know that there are people who are making 200 square foot apartments. And I was shocked. I was like, "How does this make sense?" But then, when you look into it, you see, especially uh, within uh, Asia, there are these things, and people make it work. We, as a demographic, as a culture, we know that we can make things work. So we did this. So, yeah, in my project in Andheri Azad Nagar, uh, we have units which are 187 square feet, 250 square feet. Uh, we called we we started with a campaign called flexi dances right these are those units which are extremely palatable which can you know uh, which are not necessary in an area like andheri where the ticket sizes are huge where the uh, size of flats is huge a 200 square foot flat is still something that people do want because for the professionals who are at vira desai road and everywhere else going all the way to you know borevali bhaindar or wherever is still a headache Yeah. So this was something that was greatly appreciated. It was an experiment per se, mm. but it was something that was taken positively, and it was also developed from another idea that when uh, basically in a project of mine we got a little additional FSI when we developed the flats that we could with the uh, that the limited infrastructure that we had, mm. uh, we made smaller sizes, but they were palatable. So then we decided, okay, now how can I sort of evolve it? Mm. We came up with the concept of flexi dances. We never marketed it much, but then when we finally did market it, within I think three weeks, we had eighty percent of our inventory just sold out. So my experiments would always be around home ownership centre rather than mm. you know look chasing a trend and then going after this or that. So it will be more like Mumbai city focus, or are you going to plan to expand in other cities as well? So as of right now, it is absolutely Mumbai city focus. Mm. There are things which I find extremely interesting. Like I do find uh, service living or mm. uh, you know the senior living extremely interesting. I have friends who are doing it, mm. uh, but you know. As of right now, our hands are tied up with the projects that are there within Mumbai, and you know this city just keeps on giving. So, yes, at a certain point of time, when we have the kind of scale, the kind of bandwidth to look at projects outside Mumbai, mm. why not? I'm an architect. My sister is an architect. My brother-in-law is an architect. My wife is a graphic designer. So there is like this full creative circle within just mm. the four of us. we do want to get into uh, you know the airbnb modules where you make those houses which have a return and everything mm. but that would be a passion project uh, yeah. you know not for say something where i take like a huge swath of land and make 100 houses or something mm. that, so, but so yeah so uh, whatever our hobbies are also they are little real estate related mm. but that would be something that you know is just a little something that is started as a Side hustle and whatever shape it takes. So sustainability has become really important in real estate. So how the group is uh, implementing and practicing sustainability in your projects? So sustainability is something that yes, we do take very seriously. Everyone does today. You know, mm-hmm. whether you want to or not, you have to. The more you align yourself with it, the better it is. When we look at sustainability, we look at what are the practical aspects that you know make sense plastering solar panels on you know on your terrace is not something that necessarily is going to be sustainable you know i mean 
short, it, it, it's a very nice gimmick as such. But the, is, is the quality of sunlight enough to generate the kind of electricity that you need to, to stay off grid or you know to actually make an impact on the building that you have created? Mm-hmm. Or are there other things that you can do? So one of the things that we are currently looking at within our lower parallel project, within our Oshiwara project is water sustainability. Mm-hmm. The amount of water that an individual ends up consuming, wasting, not recycling, mm-hmm. these are things that are going to make an impact, you know, short term and long term within, in fact, during lockdown also, uh, you know, there was this buzz around the local villages around uh, Mumbai, uh, there were these marches that were going on because people were like, we don't have water to yeah. irrigate because yeah. you guys have your clubhouses uh, pumped with water, mm. you know. Which again brings you to the concept of how sustainable is an amenity also. Mm. So how do you make things sustainable? How do you keep them sustainable? Do I necessarily need fresh water for washing my cars? Can I rather give recycled grey water over there? Mm. Do I need to put water, do I, do I need to put fresh water in my gardens? Do I need to put fresh water for my slabs or can I have some sort of recycled grey water over there as well? So, mm. These are avenues that we are currently exploring, mm. wherein my existing projects, if they themselves can sort of become a supply chain for the raw materials that I need for my uh, future projects, you know, and also for uh, providing water to uh, and nourishment to the amenities that, you know, we have provided. I'm not saying that you need a grey water swimming pool or anything crazy mm-hmm. like that, mm-hmm. but then beyond a certain point, uh, you know, uh, know how much you can recycle something, appreciate it and try to integrate it within the system, mm. you know, especially if it is practical. Mm. So we in fact did a very deep study on uh, Singapore sewage system because it is fantastic. Mm. The water management that those guys are doing, they are, I mean the grey water is being recycled to for microchip processing mm. which requires a quality of water which is beyond drinking water as well yeah so then we were looking at can this be scaled mm. how practically can it be scaled where can i you know i mean necessarily i don't want to uh, start uh, you know going head on with intel that mm. you know with my gray water i'm gonna make microchips but then okay I don't want microchip level water, but then can we go to a level of water which can be recycled again and again? Can the water that we are uh, using, uh, you know, recycling, can it be used for slabs? Can it be used for curing slabs? Can it be used in construction? Yeah. You know, let's look at conversations over there. So we have actually had this conversation with our contractor that mm-hmm. tomorrow when I have this project ready, the, 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 the water treatment uh, plants that I actually want to implement within them, mm. can they generate the kind of water which will at least carry on my future this thing and not make us rely on our already overburdened natural resources. Mm. And we are looking at it and you know that is what sort of keeps us going that hey there is this thing which is a possibility, let's, mm. let's look at it in this manner. Let's look at it. So sustainability, Yes, but then to what level do you want to achieve sustainability and what practical implications can you have with that sustainability? So solar, definitely I want to do solar, you know, but then the solar that I do on my terraces, is that is that something that makes sense? Is are we uh, putting money into a water treatment plant and, you know, knowing that this is something that is actually going to create more impact? So yeah. cost-benefit analysis regarding that and then, having a you know some development around that somewhere you know the awareness of the sustainability practices also matter a lot because at the end of the day whatever expense uh, or whatever cost the project is incurring mm-hmm. on uh, you know uh, having sustainability practices integrated into it at the end of the day that cost I have to recover from the customer so the customer needs to know that whatever practices I'm putting in are value for money. In the long run, in the in the idea that today you're making a lifetime purchase, the lifetime purchase that you're making, 
the sustainability practices that I am incorporating into the project are actually practices that are that have practical applications. These are not gimmicks that I am doing for you know just for the sake of some deed certification or yeah. just for a title. Yeah. I am actually putting this in because it generates more value for the project and for the customer and for the stakeholders across the board within the project. So Anirudh, from your vantage point, hmm. what would you say are the current trends that are shaping the real estate industry, especially the city, Mumbai city? Hmm. What are the trends you think people need to watch out for and are actually, uh, you know, making the real estate industry grow and evolve further? I think one of the one of the trends that people have to look at that has a very practical application to it also is consolidation. Hmm. You know, you have a project, your neighbor has a project, don't necessarily look at it as competition. Look at whether you both can pool in resources and create a better project. Amalgamate and, you know, generate more value. At the end of the day, you have a thousand square foot project, two BHAs. He has a thousand square foot project, uh, thousand, sorry, ten thousand square foot project, or thousand square meter project, he has a thousand square meter zone. You guys both are making two BHAs competing with each other. And let's see if you can join hands, get more projects involved. Because what is happening is the sense of gated community is somewhere being appreciated across Mumbai. Yeah. Earlier, what used to happen is uh, the reason why Western suburbs are such a strong market mm-hmm. is because the sense of gated community. So you can make that much more within the layout, and you will know that that will be appreciated. Mm-hmm. So you know, uh, like. 200 uh, flat projects, 600 flat projects, these were some things that were appreciated Kandivali, Malad, Borivali. Mm. But now you come towards Parla, I know that in Parla there are now projects which are 180 flat projects. Okay. The reason being that when the lockdown happened, people realized that they are a social feature, there is only so much sociability that they will be able to maintain within their own project. Mm. Can't have every, you can't reach out to everyone that you used to reach out to. You mm-hmm. can't do everything that you used to do. Mm-hmm. The size of the project and Mumbai being a very small city, there is only so much availability of land. Mm-hmm. So you want more done on the land uh, than what you are getting. Always. Mm-hmm. That happens by amalgamation and that is somewhere also happening but it, it is not something that people are aware of. Uh, I mean, when RERA started, there were 20,000 developers. Yeah. After RERA, after demonetization, after everything that our industry has witnessed, all the regularizations that have been put into place, there are I think now 12,000 developers. This number is further going to shrink. Mm-hmm. I think as it shrinks, the idea should not be that, you know, the 12,000, uh, let's say, uh, 2000 just vanished away. No, the idea is that the 2000 developers should join hands with other developers. Mm-hmm. You know, and that is somewhere I think also a generational uh, shift because today, when I have a project and you know I'm talking to my friend and we realize that it is that there is maybe a plot in between rather than fight for that plot, mm-hmm. we just go like you know what, you come in, the three of us can pool together. Mm-hmm. The government has incentivized us. Uh, making amalgamated projects because in the long run it puts lesser load on the infrastructure you know I can provide more within that land I uh, the end point of resources allocation is that much better so to that level uh, my open space deficiencies will be lesser my uh, number of the layout size will be better so I can plan it better so to that effect you know what rather than fight for it or something why don't we both join hands? Why don't we offer more value to the stakeholders, to the societies that are being redeveloped, so to yeah. the committee members, mm-hmm. and also to the endpoint customer? Today, what happens is that when there are like 30, 40 flags and I want to give a swimming pool, the, even if it is possible, mm-hmm. the committee members will be like, it's not maintenance, but when there are 100 people, there are 100 families over there, then that is not an issue for you. So, Look at amalgamation, you know, rather than worrying about who oh, that guy can, you know, I have to outshine that guy. Mm-hmm. Look at collaboration. So, 
when you talk about amalgamation, even for our viewers to understand, we are talking about JVs, right? Joint ventures. Yeah. So when it comes to joint ventures, of course, it does have its advantage, but it also has its disadvantage. Uh, I'll quote a recent example, DB Reality, right? They mm. have a lot of other partners involved in and then that project did not kick off like how it was promised to home buyers, money was stuck off home buyers. Yeah. So even that creates a bit of a hesitance from home buyers. So how a home buyer should know that this JV is going to be like where I won't get my money stuck. There will be delivery happening, position happening because in joint ventures at least they know there are so many partners, right? In a standalone a building, like how you said, for your Khandelwal, people know the accountability is coming directly from the Khandelwal, mm. right? Mm. But when it comes to JVs, the hesitance and the fear is always there in a home buyer. So how would you address that? See, a purchase is always a choice. Yeah. Right? I'm not saying that all JVs are good. When I'm saying amalgamation, I'm saying across the industry, there are always going to be certain Mm. examples there are always going to be certain projects that for whatever reason for whatever understanding that the uh, companies had between themselves it didn't work out mm. it's an unfortunate circumstance right. for everyone involved yeah but at the end of the day the home buyer today has that much more information available to them on their fingertips mm. that they can check the track record you know if Khandela Lupe is is amalgamating with uh, another brand say and they know that both the brands have a good track record then go in by all means you know understand and you have a right as a home buyer to ask for your protections for your safeties mm -hmm. what is the type of agreement that is happening what are the guarantees how is the uh, payment plan mm -hmm. i only want a construction link payment plan there is no other way that i want to put my money into this because i'm not sure mm -hmm. so at the end of the day you can always Mitigate the risk even on your end. Mm. You know, at the see, we know it's a home buyer's market. Mm. We will have to adhere to the practices that are put in place, the benchmarks that are put in place by the home buyer. Mm. And we will appreciate it and we'll so to a point where we ourselves tell the home buyer that was we have a construction link payment plan. Mm. I'm not asking you money in like four, four months, five, five months. I'm saying that when my performance reaches its level of a surety of satisfaction, mm. give me my next installment at that point of time. So when you're looking at a JV that has happened, they'll always insist that I want to put, uh, you know, put my money via construction link payment plan. Mm. What are the guarantees today? Rera even offers you guarantee of cancellation of flat. Yeah. You know, so at that point of time, see your money is protected by the uh, by the agencies involved. Mm. How you protect it, how you choose to protect it. That is your perspective. There are so many consultants today who also help home buyers True. to understand the last mile journey. Mm. So you like the building, you like the project, mm. you got in a good deal, you're worried about your money, okay, consult one of them. So tell me, you're a known brand. Yeah. You must be having a checklist when you go for JVs, right? So what is your basic checklist in partnering <laughs> with certain brand? So see, when I say amalgamation, I yeah. myself have not as such, I'm a, you know, gone in for a JV yet. Mm -hmm. It is just a trend that I see on guys when 33.9 layout is being incentivized by the government, which is, you know, the approvals are flying, it is like, it's going fast. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons is because the government understands that the more sub lanes there are, the more by lanes there are, you know, the more infrastructural load is there. Yeah. The roads today of Mumbai uh, were actually made for I think 50 cars or something per uh, square unit or something. Mm. There are 500 or 5,000 cars per that same unit. Mm. You have to decrease the infrastructural load. How do you do that? By amalgamating more people together. So that cluster that forms mm. opens up spaces. You get a chance to breathe. Yeah. You know? So at the end of the day, amalgamation is because the government is encouraging it, it makes sense even for us, it makes sense for the end customer mm. to, you know, to, to go into a project which has that much more to offer for your money. Mm. So look at it in that sort of sense. Yes, where there are hyper-local uh, hyper markets like Pali Hills and Malabar Hills where it is not possible 
happy yeah. but then they have their own charm then that is a different perspective altogether but across the board you look at lokanwala itself you have these guys in parath infra rishabh raj you know all these big brands they are all doing layouts massive size layouts 4000 6000 7000 square meter layout but at the end of the day these layouts they will offer more bang for the buck for the customer also the amenities that they offer the lifestyle that you will be offered so that is why amalgamation when i say because 1000 square meter is simply not going to offer the same charm as a 2000 or a 3000 or a 4000 and if you have the opportunity to collaborate then please do so between the parties themselves also you can always have a certain agreement that is made out where my integrity and your integrity is not compromised by each other's practices so we come across that common ground so we are seeing redevelopment happening a lot in mumbai right and uh, recently even shri eknath shinde had come up with a proposal mm-hmm. that in redevelopment society if the majority is saying yes for the redevelopment and if there are two three people yeah. who are not agreeing to it the eviction will be done for them mm-hmm. So, do you think this is the right way to go about it, and this will at least uh, have a better impact or a negative impact when it comes to redevelopment? No, it definitely, it definitely has a positive impact. Mm-hmm. There are certain, see, there, there are genuine cases all across the board. There are genuine cases of people who don't want to shift. There are also people who are capitalizing. on that situation because they know they can use it to their advantage against yeah. the society against the builder but you know you have to look at it across the board majority wise yes absolutely it is a great decision if the if the majority of the society is convinced that you know their rights are protected they, they are going to end up with a house and you still have some emotional or irrational thought that is not letting you do this or rather you want to capitalize then absolutely uh you know the law should not side with you or you should not be given a due advantage within that uh, but then let's look at a case i know of where there was an 85 year old man mm-hmm. his sons are abroad he has a health condition he cannot move uh he's he's widowed he lives by himself he is like okay if you ask me to he knows everyone in the society he knows everything about it the watchman knows him the staff knows him You know he gets the services and everything sorted out. The builder comes in and he says that you know we have to move this guy. He's like okay, but my practical problem is where do I go? What do I do? Hmm. I have come to this house when I was thirty years old. Since the past fifty-five years of my life, this is all that I know to do. My wife is not here. I'm helpless. I myself, I cannot travel. I have a condition. Hmm. Where do I go? My kid has a job over there. He cannot come full time for me. Hmm. so then in those cases see an exception has to be made and i think that somewhere see we are all out here to do service on our uh, you know with integrity in war yeah so over there at least for that one particular odd ball or that one particular odd case you have to make certain exceptions of the rule mm-hmm. the another day they will work in your favor on you know, the mm-hmm. good karma is going to be there for you so the perspective is in that sort of sense but he has majority wise obviously mm. common sense wise we know in fact we have dealt with this situation many times mm. and we do not uh negotiate mm. you know uh, we we simply say ki okay majority is with me mm. you know we have everything in writing everything is sorted so in my case and in my whatever has been done mm. you yourself are this odd ball and we know for what reasons you are an odd ball let's let's go to court mm. let's settle this out. and then you know you have to trust the process and the process prevails mm. and it works out. so twice thrice this has happened with us and we do try to negotiate we do try to make things happen but then if there is an irrational uh, you know precedence that is being set mm. then at the end of the day see we are in this to do a business where both the parties have to enjoy a win win you know and this is the problem when because there are laws in place to protect the integrity of the gentleman that i spoke about mm. they are being taken under advantage of that per se because it is still a majority you know it will never work out in a one sided favor mm. majority being what majority being that the majority has agreed with the developer so and overall 
bigger majority is in favor of the development. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm curious to know because in Mumbai the land is not there much. Yeah, right? it's not there. Probably. Now the JVs are happening, the yeah. redevelopments are happening. But what I'm looking at a certain trend. There are so many players in this redevelopment, right? Mm -hmm. There's a different way and approach is also being done, which is also, uh, as you said, society compares, na? Ki baju wale kutna mil raha hai, uska aisa ja raha hai. So with that, I think even the developers are also spoiling. Meaning, where I'm also seeing there are uh, redevelopment societies in a very good prime location. Mm. So every developer is bidding for that particular mm. location. Every developer is treating it as, you know, Apo, let me take you to a five star, let mm. me take you a fine time and explain you how the project will look like. And even the customers are happy, the society is happy and what they are telling to the other developer is, they are you know, Hayat. Mm. So I have seen such talks. My point is, it's going to impact, right? It's going to impact a better players in the long run because the kind of, there is no rule set. Yeah. Even to a developer, you know, yeah. you are approaching a society, follow these protocols. And when those rules are not set, any kind of practices are happening. So how do we address this? So that because a saturation has come in Mumbai market, redevelopment has to happen. But there needs to be a protocol, a way to go about it for the developers also, right? See, certain practices, certain protocols, they take care of themselves. Hmm. Societies come up to me, they say, udhar gata, udhar gata. To which my answer to them is simply that, listen, at the end of the day, you have to decide whether this project happens on paper or it happens with bricks and mortar. Mm. If it has to happen with bricks and mortar, my way, and I have shown you 10 other projects that I have done with OCUC, mm. then we go about it in this manner. You can come to my sales office, you can see it, you can see everything that I'm doing, you can see my best performing sites right now. But beyond that, I don't need to give you proof of my performance. And that is the way we look at it. Of course, where the demographic matters and the demographic may demand it, mm. you know, so be it. It doesn't matter. But as such, people, at least the ones that I have had the fortune to deal with, mm. you know, have as such kept their head on their shoulders. At max, they will go like, no, we have to do 11, we have to do this, we have to do that, we have to do that, we have to do that, we have But the second, I see societies going like, we have to take it there, and we have to take it there, and we have to take it there, and we have to take it there, that is where, you know, I draw my lines. Simply because, I am not uh, in this to, you know, uh, woo you by superficial means. And this is my perspective on the thing. Maybe there are others who find it as part of their uh, storytelling or you know their gimmick. Mm. And it works out for them and bless them. It doesn't for me. Because I find it easier to define my values straight away at the very first day. Mm. You know, if this thing works out straight and true, I will speak my truth to you. Mm. You like what I'm offering, then well and good. Otherwise, there are enough projects to do within Mumbai and there are enough developers. If you want to get wood, you want to dine around, you want to go around, so be it. Mm. Find the guy who's doing it or find the you know that the organization that's doing it, it's not me. No, I agree, that is your value, yeah. right? But I want to understand how to get control of this. Where I feel Naretu Cred I kind of organization can come up with certain <laughs> protocols, right? So why is this not happening? Because the thing is that at the end of the day, somewhere certain experiences teach the industry themselves certain things, certain practices, then they know. There are these things that have happened. You know, even in the past they used to happen and then people you hear these people going, are you to say gumata body body patikata? So there are people who know at the end of the day. And with information aid and today see there are forums, there are chat groups, there are uh, so many platforms. But there are no protocols of communication. There For example, problems. I'll tell you, I have, I don't want to name a society which is there in very prime location of mm. Mumbai. Mm. There were three players bidding for it. Mm. Where even the developer who had a certain track record could go to the extent to telling Mumbaiers, oh, you know, iska aisa hai, I know him personally, aisa hai bad mouthing the other player in front of the customer. 
So do yeah. you think there should be a protocol even how developers are dealing with these societies? Is it a bad practice? Yes, it is. Mm. No, bad. No. Is it something that's unfair? Mm. It's not slander that's being written. Mm. You know, how I want to woo a certain society depends on the curation of my information. Mm. Ethical, non-ethical is a different subject mm. altogether. You know, for, for a certain person it must be that the competition is cutthroat, I must do what it takes. My perspective as I've said is a little hippie. Mm-hmm. As compared to that where I say make peace not war, to kara and I kara which is happening. These things at the end of the day they make your track record. Mm-hmm. So today a person can go like Usne me go either go by say okay, uske kitte mein, usko hai. Mm-hmm. You know, and if his projects have more OC than mine do, then you know, go for it. But I know there was a society who, uh, very recently in Bandra who said that this certain gentleman is saying that he will not sell a flat till he gives the flats to the society. I said, please go with that person. Best of luck to you. The day the project happens, I, I would want you guys to make a case study and give it back to me. I would like to read about this practice. But this is not me. I'm a self-funded developer. My working capital is ex- extremely expensive. You know, and it is being utilized continuously. You guys are in Bandra, well and understood. You guys are not, you know, uh, floating in cloud nine. This is happening or not. My realities are different. So if you want to go ahead with that developer, at the end of the day, it's your choice. Mm. That's where it matters. At the end of the day, the public, you know, it, it boils down to choice, right? People learn, people understand. How many times can this gimmick work? How far can it work? Mm-hmm. It stops itself. And then when it does stop, well, at that point of time, it is looked at from a certain perspective. Mm-hmm. That it is a good practice or a bad practice. Well, that practice has its own red flags. Mm-hmm. People understand that if we have to eat this food, it means there is something hanky back. It has happened. It has happened as I, I mean, I'm not even that old yeah, uh, within the industry. This is the last 10 years, but I have seen things change. I have seen the customer get smarter, I have seen the stakeholders get smarter. Mm-hmm. So people demand certain things. So you still feel it should not be regularized right now by the bodies which are there in place when it comes to the realtors? I feel that it is a very, I feel that it is a very subjective issue mm-hmm. and I feel that there are more pressing issues that need to be addressed rather than this one. How? And, and those are things that we are actually addressing and we are looking at also. Now, when you say mitigate pollution, mm-hmm. yes, mitigate pollution. How do you mitigate pollution where the costs that are incurred do not uh, become a burden on the project and become a burden on the end customer? Yeah. yeah. Today, I don't want to go up to my customer and go like, Aapka per square foot rate bad gaya, kyunki mujhe government ne bula ye ye karne ko. And this is why I have machines and their bill is like this, so it's like an end point. Mm. So there we fight the good fight. Mm. You know, certain things you take on faith that they will take care of themselves. And they do. Mm. As I said, right at this, uh, you know, somewhere in our interview that there were 20,000 developers pre-rera, pre-demonetization. Yeah. Yeah. They shrank down to 12,000 developers. This number is only going to go further down. No, how it that. goes down is, see, the people who are about that life, you know, wine, dine, fine, whatever, mm. they might either decide to leave or they might decide to come to a developer and say, listen, you know what, you're good at making the structure, I'm good at doing the guys. Mm. So that's an argument and play to our strengths. And at that point of time, I don't mind. Probably my only uh, request in that would be, don't slander anyone. Mm. You have the charisma that I don't have, go for it, use it by all means. You know, you probably don't uh, get to a point where you understand how the practicalities of making the structure actually work. Mm-hmm. I'll play that part. I will never say no to an offer like that. So in that, but in that sort of sense, the industry does take care of itself also. Mm-hmm. Rira happened because beyond a certain point of time, people got tired. And I only realized how bad the reputation of developers was uh, was in lockdown when I went on the Reddit uh, real estate yeah. forum. Yeah. And I started defending. Uh, 
No, it was also got to do with the kind of advertisement were coming in. Absolutely. Also, the promises which were absolutely made. The customer absolutely. grievance so, was not being addressed. So, so, right? so somewhere, this is the thing, right? So, you know, when you are in your own family business, mm. you, uh, and you have to understand that you know, father at the office, you have a boss at home. The personal professional life takes a hit beyond a certain point of time. You do not want to look at the pro professional sphere, which is why. Uh, knowing your exposure becomes that much more important, which is why you know bodies like Naretko Kritai they matter because when you are part of a larger whole, you know you get to know that much more. You get to know the problems that other people are facing that you know already to avoid, True. or you know uh, solutions that you can incorporate yeah. today. You know which otherwise is always recycled within that same uh, circle. So. You open your mind, you get to know that much more, and that is where you also know that collaboration, you know, at least that is my perspective of the way I have seen things. Mm -hmm. It works way better. So, you know, we are noticing when it comes to now second generation and third generation players in real estate market, mm -hmm. the digital transformation is already happening, but when I talk about these players, they are being more open when it comes to technology and real estate technology, be hot tech, prop tech, clean tech. So, what do you think the future would be? Do, do, would we see more tech enabled solutions, not just for the customer, but also now being in the back end where the operations to the construction level, everything would be applied so it becomes seamless? So, we are definitely going to see more tech. Tech is there to stay 100%. The way tech is being integrated uh, in the global real estate industry is fantastic. We are still opening up to it, yeah. which also means that at least in the uh, it, and I'm going to strictly talk about Mumbai real estate uh, industry over here. Mm -hmm. There will be certain teething problems, but then you get over it. See these things. The, the tech comes with its own prejudices and inhibitions. Mm -hmm. But then the more you use it, the more you understand it, the more better you can apply it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you get there mm -hmm. eventually. When I was in architecture, AutoCAD became a thing. Like when I was learning architecture, AutoCAD became a thing at that point of time. Mm -hmm. My professors used to absolutely hate it. Mm -hmm. You know, when you draft it, your your soul connects with the design and all that who have or just you know your your opinion on the entire thing. Mm -hmm. But I've also seen how AutoCAD made life easy. Yeah. You move a step more than that, there is 3ds Max. A step more than that is Google SketchUp. A step more than that is Revit. When you come to Revit, within Revit there's BIM models, the building information modular systems. People today understand that virtually I can recreate the building brick by brick mm -hmm. to the same level, to the same scale. Yeah. I can therefore have an idea about the problems that I can already encounter. What is the limitation to this? The limitation to this is the skill set of the person who's handling the BIM model. Mm. Like the limitation to me building my superstructure or my structure is mm. the ability or the skill set of my green guy, my contractors, my uh, mm. people involved. Similarly, over here, the limitation is to the guy who's handling the BIM model. Now, if you're getting a good guy or a good person mm. with a solid reputation, with a proven track record, little more expensive, then please go penny foolish complex. Mm. You know, don't try to save 10,000, 20,000 over here, still want the payment and you know, get something where you have to compromise. Mm. Go for the person who has the track record. Mm. Also understand what technologies you actually need to apply and what technologies you can go without. Mm. That is actually a certain uh, decision that we take to the cost benefit analysis. What if I have a PMC instead of a build model mm. for the same cost? Yeah. Does that make more sense to me? To me personally, it absolutely does. Mm. What if I have a PMC and a build model? Does that make sense to me? Mm. Okay. What kind of value can it generate? Mm. Can it make my construction happen faster? Can it make my uh, the life easier for me and my end customer? If these are things that can happen, what is the applicability of it? What is the, uh, what is the, uh, you know, set of complications that can arise from it on the labor force that is on the site? Mm. 
These are decisions that you have to take and you have to take it you know, across the spectrum of your project. Mm -hmm. If it makes sense, then do implicate it. If not, then maybe wait for that technology to become that much more integrated within the industry. You know, people do arrive, people do come in. Mm -hmm. They do make better things mm -hmm. out there, you know. But let them, let them also get more frequented with this. And then, when things are going good, they are going solid. Stick with the in uh, you know in the box thinking. Mm -hmm. You can you can jump to the forefront when the forefront is ready for you, so to speak. To that aspect, there is also top-down architecture, top-down construction. It is where you simultaneously construct your uh, basement and you know you construct your corners and everything. The whole thing happens together, and the life cycle of the construction becomes shorter. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. It is happening. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, on a global scale, mm -hmm. how much of it has happened within Mumbai? How yeah. practical is it to integrate it? Mm. You know, how practical is it to actually do it with bricks and mortar? Mm. Do you know a person? So, there are these, you have to, with technology, you have to do your research on how much can you actually integrate within your project or mm. not. Mm. And if you can, then go for it. These things they actually help out. Like mm. one of the underlying uh, variable costs. Of redevelopment is actually rentals. Yeah. For redevelopment society. Mm -hmm. I redevelop a society, I am emptying, even a small one, I'm emptying uh, 30 flats together. Mm -hmm. If I'm emptying a bigger society, I'm emptying 50 flats together. Mm -hmm. The market around may not necessarily have the absorption for 50 flats all at once on a rental basis. Mm -hmm. What is that going to create? That is going to create a spike in it. This variable cost is going up. Can I balance this cost by uh, shortening the construction cycle of my project? Mm. Yes. Over there, in the short term, that might be a bigger cost to me, but in the long term, it is definitely a better value proposition. So we look at it from that perspective, technology. Or at the same time, even marketing-wise, mm. how how much uh, how faster can my inventory go? You know, based on the data that I can rely on, what is that uh, subset of the parameters? for that data to come to its conclusions. Mm. So you have, you know, these technologies are relatively new. You have to understand them before you actually apply them. You have to understand the track record of these technologies and then you know that, okay, this is being applied. There are proven case studies, there are proven success stories. Let's do it. True, so, I agree. But would, would, would you say that like how we decide on MNT's basis on the demographic, right? Mm. Would you say that technology adoption in Mumbai market is not there in the uh, very high or mature level compared to the global market. It's because of the kind of developers you're looking at. It can be developer at the growth stage, developer who is just building the name or the completely branded developer. So my question is, it can be also based on the where the developer is at what stage, right? Sometimes at the growth stage, they might not see technology it can be a budget thing also so do you think it is also basis on what the developer is at what stage that's why the technology adoption maybe is lesser uh, so definitely it has to do with the developer being at whatever stage they are in the life cycle of their project 100 percent. Mm -hmm. but it also depends on again the uh the track record of the technology itself see there is prefabricated construction that is going on in UK since mm. World War II, mm. when Blitzkrieg used to happen over there, when the Germans bombed, uh, you know, the absolute soul out of a city, they knew they had to make it faster mm. because you couldn't live the way you, you, you know, in a squatter type settlement, unsanitary and everything, you had a shrink population already, mm. you had to construct faster. So they did. Mm. You tried to do that in India, in, within Mumbai, within India. You know, the MMR region itself, the biggest challenge that happened was waterproof. Yeah. For oil. Yeah. So, you know, now we are doing this in 2020. That has already happened post World War, whatever, 1956, you know, whatever, whenever the second happened. It could not get perfected. Mm -hmm. You know, so then automatically, one or two projects, the technology itself gets a prejudice against it. 
Now over there in UK, the uh, most of the uh, ownership is a rental basis. You know, so if I don't like my flat, I can always move out over here. The person is buying it. He has to live with it. The consequences of you adopting a technology, uh, you know, going in a little blind, so to speak, has a different impact. At the end of the day, people do have their inhibitions with what technology, when to use. But that innovation can come not having the awareness also about the technology, right? There is an awareness issue, but at the end of the day, if I go to my, let's say, I just go to my dad and I'm like, oh, I want to accommodate this technology within my project. Hmm. First question that you will ask is, uh, you know, kidna chal hai? Or which other developers Which other developers Where in India is this going on? Where in Dubai? Which other developers are going on? Okay If I say that Dubai is going on in Dubai Then what is the cost of the cost? You know, can I sustain getting the team over here and doing this thing? And then I have to explain basically the life cycle and this thing You know, that okay, see this is the impact that will have That perspective matches up then yes now awareness issue, awareness issue wise, I can be aware of a plethora of technologies mm-hmm. across the board. How many of them can I actually afford is another question. People mm-hmm. tend to do it. For a smaller project also, people have used CI matrix. Mm-hmm. Because at the end of the day, people know that you cannot hold on to your inventory. You want to... Yeah, and also data know. analytics is something Absolutely. now every developer Absolutely. has to open up to. When it came in, there were still questions at that point of time also, how reliable is this data? You can get lost in this data. What's the point of this data? Is it good to ask local brokers? What's going on in the market? It's a soft lag that you can see. So, somewhere, you know, the perspective shift happens and you're there. You know, you're still open to it. It is going to take time. Yeah, it is going to take time. Yeah, okay. Yeah. We cannot expect, neither should we expect an overnight change. So somewhere, you know, there are there are also uh, government policies mm. into play. Mm. Today, if I have to do prefabricated construction, how much of it is actually being compliant with the you know the standards that are set by the government? How much of it is actually earthquake resistant as per the mm. set standards of the government? Yeah. And these are based on certain Inalienable truths that you know the, the data that is set, mm. your tectonic plates, your seismic activity, everything, everything, soil testing, whatever came out. So I cannot just take technology from some place or out of the globe and just put it. I have to retrofit it. Yeah. That retrofitting will always take its own time, but still, I feel the shift to embracing technology has been a lot more. USA evolved from malls, strip malls, WalMarts to Amazons. Mm. We are seeing that all together, which is why over here they say only channel marketing. Karni chai. What is only channel marketing? It is across the board market. Yeah. yeah. You know, so, but today if I tell you that we go Amazon pe flat beach, ka hai, technology to hai, kar sakta ho kya. Mm. you know the innovations because this is a once in a lifetime purchase. Oh. It will take its time for adoption, which is why Amazon also started the first product as books. Mm. Yeah. You know, it is it is the TG that is going to easily adapt these things. And it's the same thing with even this. Apart from the technologies that you know are still coming in, there are certain technologies that uh, we have you know uh, wholeheartedly adopted. Mm. Like drone technology is something that you know when it came in, people already understood that it is so important to zoom out on your project and you know see the landscape around it. Talk about it. See where on where all your vantage points are. See how uh, you know, see you know what will be the view of your flats. Yeah. Kind of like although this is possible by the drone surveys that happen today. Mm. In fact, to a level where there are there are these certain uh, drone contractors who actually even uh, do echolocation and soil testing by the sonar that they apply on their drones. I have not yet come across one, but I know that there are quite a few that are there. Uh, would I like to use them? Of course, absolutely. Mm. You know, it is about the uh, speed at which I'm getting the data and how reliable it is. Yeah. So there are these, there are certain technologies across the value chain that are already there. Aluform, for that matter. Mm. Aluform, when it had uh, 
come in it was something that was looked at ki only for bigger projects you know we should use it we can use it mm-hmm. for smaller project it compromises on rigidity flexibility wagera wagera but now people are understanding that when i have a typical floor i can look at hybrid structures when and i can use part aluminum part conventional and i can actually create a fantastic structure which is that much more uh, waterproof and you know that much more structurally sound that much more aesthetically pleasing so we are adopting them it is again about the scale awareness and understanding about uh, and the proof of concept of the technology itself so lastly i want to ask you like it, it was interesting you got the amazon and omni channel example we have seen the evolution of brokers brokers also have yeah. been in real estate right earlier it was a traditional method by bringing in clients showing them the uh, apartments or the land or whatsoever now we have also now seen mandate business coming in we have noticed the tech enabled channel partners where they are getting you leads also from online yeah. and also uh, providing you sales uh, officers on on your sites and everything so when it comes to broker market and i'm sure you must have dealt with your projects with the mm-hmm. uh, brokers do you see the traditional method will go away sooner and more of this mandate business more of this channel partners where uh, this bigger the players are for example square yards and rock will be taking over the market i i don't think that the in Entire market will be captured by the bigger players. Majority of it, yes, of course, but not the entire one. And again, the uh, the performances of each agency uh, agency depends on your hyper local market. Yeah. You know, there are certain places like there is Parley East. Parley East is an area where bigger layouts. There is one bigger layout that I know of now being done by. Other than that, the layouts are always smaller. The sizes are smaller. The demographic that is there in Parley is essentially those that are forty, fifty plus, mm. where they themselves can also not, uh, you know, use the technology that these big groups rely on always. Mm. You know, because Anurag uh, and uh, JLL or whatever Guardian or it, all of them. are quite reliant on the technology that they use apart from their network of mm. uh, you know ground force mm. brokers etc etc but at the end of the day how much of it can be adapted by the end customer from which area and where mm. so we come to our last segment which is quite famous is called rapid fire here you can't take much time whatever first thought comes in right. your mind you have to answer that right. so my first question to you is Favorite Mumbai spot to unwind after a hectic day of a meeting. Juhu Beach. Juhu Beach. I stay in Juhu. I take my kid to Juhu Beach. Nice. So one Mumbai street food you can never resist. Vada Pav. Your go-to stress buster during intense project deadline. Playing chess on the phone. Okay. The most bizarre request or suggestion you have ever received from a client. I think, as such, I I I just I like you know I have not. Come across any eccentricity? Nothing. Yeah, so None. you know nothing that I can not accommodate. None. Yeah. So your secrets to staying creative and innovative in the real estate industry? I think uh, just being solution centric. You know, so just trying to look at the bright side, trying to see that okay, maybe there is a working over here, maybe there's something. Mm. Uh, looking at a problem from a jovial perspective, and you know. अच्छा वही अभी पता चल गया बाद में पता चलता तो क्या लाभ हो क्या हो जाता सो यू नो सम वेयर ट्राइंग टू टेक इट इन अ लाइटर थिंग द मोस्ट एक्स्ट्रा वेगेंट परचेस यू मेड टू सेलिब्रेट अ प्रोजेक्ट माइलस्टोन आई थिंक आई बॉट माय वाइफ अ गुड ब्रांडेड पर्स और समथिंग व्हेन देयर वाज अ परमिशन दैट वाज जस्ट नॉट कमिंग एंड आई गॉट इट यू नो आई थिंक आई आई हैड शॉट ऑफ बीन Tip to him on the last notes at that point of time with my stresses, so I was like, I need to sort this out as well. But yes, the most hilarious incident during a property showcase or a launch event, if you had come across any. I'd rather not talk about it on the camera. <laughs> okay, so which book impacted you personally and professionally? Quite a few of them actually. Deep work. Mm. 
mm. has impacted me a lot. Um, the story of Jack Ma, the story of Elon Musk, uh, you know, just certain things that I could uh, pick up from them. If you have to tell why deep impact, what was the deep work? Deep work, sorry. So deep, so the reason why deep work really impacted me was because uh, when you know, you know, with technology, it can sort of come to place in information overload. You know, the way, in fact, there's another book called Hooked, which mm. makes you understand the way social media and all these technologies make you hooked on it. It's like a drug, right? That yeah. dopamine hit. Yeah. So somewhere when you allocate 90 minutes away from your phone on your work, which is impossible, by the way, in our line of work, because you have to be on the phone continuously, but you try to lock your social medias and stay true to the tasks of the day for at least 90 minutes, yeah. it jumps up your productivity by that much. So that is something that, you know, I always do try to do. And which is why I like to be in the car because because I have motion sickness, I can't be on social media mm-hmm. that much. So I can sort of stay focused on pure work. Nice. If you want in real estate, what field do you think you would be in? I think just before uh, real estate, I was in this sort of a marketing uh, addiction phase where I was thinking of, you know, like maybe looking at venturing into my own marketing firm and stuff like that because I have that sort of uh, creative tilt. Mm. I, I like to look at things in a unique perspective. So, so uh, advertising, marketing, yeah. If you could have dinner with any real estate industry figure, living or historical, who would it be? I think Elon Musk. And why? Oh, because you, uh, there is not a single moment which you don't uh, absorb something uh, you don't know worthy from. Mm. Just the way he will, you know. Even the way that he, uh, he, just, he just effortlessly delivers a joke, you know, you, you just you're like, oh my goodness, like, mm. you know, this is, this is amazing. Yeah. So if you had to pick a favorite among all the projects you have worked on, which one holds a special place in your heart? I think the Andheri one, the, mm. the Omkar Flexi Tenses, simply because that was a concept that uh, me and my marketing team, we came up on the fly. Mm. We were not understanding what to do with the product that we had on hand and how to really uh, how to really give our vision across the table to the end buyer and then by the time that it actually shaped up uh, we understood that the amount of uh, digital advertising that we needed to do was not even required like people just went over there and they understood how to use it so that was something that was very magical you know when you can deliver your vision, not just the product, but the vision itself of the project. And then when you hear your own uh, words from the home buyer without any prompt, this could do SAP SAP that is a very wholesome moment. That, that, you know, it, it's a moment of mind. Nice. So if you could collaborate with any architect or designer living on historical, who would it be? Uh, so many. Kengo Kumar, Tadao Andro, Louis Kahn, Le Corbusier, so the guy who basically made Chandigarh. Uh, but then, you know, like it would have to be on my final decisions. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, Daniel Rishkin, I can just go on and on and on. Okay. Yeah. Describe your leadership style in three words extremely flexible, very rooted. And I think my staff would like to say hot headed. Really? Yeah. Okay. So is there a man- mantra or motto you personally live by and you apply in your personal and professional uh, setup? Bobby Sati. Okay. Yes. Uh, the imperfect perfection, the perfect imperfection. So you, you sort of have to take the good with the bad and you have to see that, you know, that in itself also is a thing of value. So every time that there is a project that comes with its, uh, you know, issues or problems or something, you have to see that, okay, you have to understand that the reason why you can do this project and only you can do it is because you know that you can solve this problem. 
and sometimes appreciate that fact. And that just sort of uh, sometimes it, it, it makes the entire process uh, better sweet, more sweet than bitter. Mm. So, you know, we, we try to stick to that. And lastly, I want to know what's the best piece of advice you have received in your career which you still swear by and the worst piece of advice that you didn't live by but it still makes you chuckle. The best piece of advice uh, was by Iran and Mari, so do more. Okay. Just keep doing, keep doing, keep doing, keep doing. Mm. See, this interview for us might not have gone this good, but if I do this for the 10th time, I know I'll ace it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it, it's what you apply. So you didn't get the permission, go again. Go again, go again. You didn't get it the way you wanted, go again. Ask again. Yeah. You know, do it to a point beyond self-respect and shamelessness. Like, don't let these things matter. You crush your ego, but just keep doing more. Nice. And do more is something that, and also the second thing that he said was beautiful was, uh, worry but do. Yeah. You know, the, that's like, okay, you're scared to, you know, uh, Get, get beyond this point because it might not have the impact on your project that you think but go beyond that mm. move beyond that point somewhere you can always uh, you know go back to rectifying things but do 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 I think that's why we see how far away it is right absolutely, now right absolutely but do more is one advice that I try to do so nahi work out more isko wapis try karte nahi work out more isko wapis try karte and the other thing is I oh yeah there's one more book Creative Incorporated. It's about the story of Pixar. Yeah. It's a beautiful book and it's one of the best books that I have read uh, in my life. So it says that commit to small mistakes, uh, you know, like don't don't avoid small mistakes in order to uh, think that you can perfect it. Like, mm. You know, because smaller mistakes are easier to rectify than bigger ones. So the so Hiran and Sir's advice with coupled with this is what sort of just keeps driving me. Keep and the worst advice you have received, which you haven't, of course, uh, followed, <laughs> still makes you chuckle when you look back. Honestly, I've uh, I've, I've just blacked out uh, bad advices. You know, That's a good you, way. <laughs> yeah, no, because you you know you, you just uh, okay. Yeah, one of them was uh, I won't say who, but खुद के permissions खुद कौन pass करता है तू तो developer है तेरे लिए आदमी काम करने का है it was a horrible advice. Mm. Uh, Coming it, from a developer. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, from one of the persons in the line, mm. one of the stakeholders, I think that that is just, uh, you know, because you have to be rooted mm. to what you're doing. And I like to be rooted to everything. I might be able to delegate at a later stage. But at the start, I sort of just have to see how things work out. And that is maybe a flaw, that is maybe a weakness, but. It's how I'm able to understand what to delegate when, yeah. you know, and it also makes me understand the hardship of the process itself. Mm. If I think that I can get this permission within seven days, but I can't, I have no right to demand it from a person. So we have come to end to our interview. Thank you so much, Anil, for joining us today and letting our viewers also to know about your uh, brand, Khalil Yuan Group. Thank you and again so for the, having me. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure viewers will know more about you and I'm sure we are looking forward to more upcoming projects that we have mentioned and show down the line we are going to be again where we can talk about you expanding to different cities too. Absolutely, that's the hope. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.